Our next speaker is uh, Steve Roundsley from Dow AgroSciences and also at the University of Arizona. Uh, I've been fortunate to work with Steve for the last, uh, I think it's at least five years. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, Steve is a really remarkable scientist and genomicist. He started off uh, in plant biology with a PhD at UC San Diego, working on uh, flowering time development, and then moved to Tiger, where he was one of the leaders of the Arabidopsis genome sequencing project, of course, the first plant uh, to be sequenced. Then he moved on to the Broad, and uh, after a brief period at the University of Arizona in the Bio5 initiative, has now taken on a lot of responsibility as the genomics leader at Dow AgroSciences. Um, and one of the really remarkable things about Steve is not only his uh, sort of scientific talents, but also his remarkable commitment to using plants for, for the greater, greater good. And uh, he's been involved, as we'll, hear, as we'll hear today, in improving a lot of different crops in developing countries with a special focus on uh, cassava. He's very passionate about working not just with the plants, but with all the stakeholders, the African scientists, the African farmers. Um, and it's really a remarkable amount of time that he puts in as a part-time effort while full-time leading this important group at, uh, at, at Dow. Um, he is recognized in 2013 with the Agricultural Greater Good Award, um, and I think his leadership has really been recognized as, as critical in moving this, this whole field forward. So it's a pleasure to hear Steve talk to us about cassava. Thanks, Dan. Um, I've never had an introduction where the, the presenter had to change pages uh, during the introduction, so thank you for those kind words. Um, so thanks, Gene. That was an amazing talk but now for something completely different. So I'm going to try and lead you through cassava genomics. Um, five years ago, that would have been a very short talk. Um, it probably would have taken this slide. Um, so hopefully, I'll be able to give you a sense of why cassava, why we're interested in cassava, uh, the role it plays in developing country, countries, and the role that all of you can play in similar kinds of projects to help um, the greater good. So. I, on this front slide, I have uh, all of the organizations involved. As Dan said, I'm now at Dow, but uh, this work was initiated when I was at the University of Arizona. And the organizations on the right-hand side are all of our African partners. I also want to thank Phil yesterday for introducing the topic of developing country agriculture, because it's, it's this tie between the high technology that we're all doing and some really basic needs elsewhere in the, in the world that I think is a really good synergy. So hopefully you recognize what this is. This is Illumina flow cell with uh, a lawn of adapters on there, very large numbers. And when I first saw this graphic, I, I, I had also been playing with some clip art for other stuff. And I had this clip art on my computer. And I thought, huh, I wonder how many people you could fit on a flow cell if each of these individual clusters is, a, is an individual. The technology is such now that we can fit the entire planet on five flow cells if every individual was a cluster. So 7.2 billion people. And just to give you a sense of how minor uh, the US agriculture component is in that planet, that's how many people are in the US, a very small fraction of that planet. Um, a much larger number, about six-fold higher, are smallholder farmers, people living on small farms in developing countries. And these um, farms are typically less than two hectares. Um, and generally, they are uh, predominantly women uh, growing crops for food and a tiny bit of income. Now, in those countries, 80% of the food the produced by that country comes from people living in this kind of situation. Um, but what is kind of ironic and very sad, actually, is that those same populations the people growing the food, 80% of the food for these countries, those people, 75% of their kids are malnourished. So this shows you how close to the line smallholder farmers are relative to their productivity. It just takes one bad uh, bout of weather, one bad bout of disease, takes them below that line, and, they're, and they, they're in really big trouble. So this is where a crops like cassava come in. Uh, cassava is a, a woody shrub. It's probably about so high, up to about sort of seven or eight feet. And it's predominantly grown for its starchy root. Now, there are, uh, for this audience, there are uh, some biofuel applications for cassava. But th this talk will focus on the, uh, the food uh, uses for it. Um, 
The, the root is, and it's a root, not a tuber. Um, it's very starchy, very little nutrition, but it's a good source of carbohydrates. Um, the plant is a member of the euphorb family, so it's related to Jotropha, another biofuel <laughs> plug. Um, but that family also consists of castor beans and rubber plants, so a very diverse set of uh, plants. But what makes it particularly applicable for developing country smallholder farmers is that it's very tolerant of very poor soils, and it's very drought tolerant. Um, but distinct from common beans that we heard about yesterday and maize, which is also grown widely in Africa, um, this has a, a unique property because it's a root. You can keep it in the ground for as long as you need it. You don't have to worry about post-harvest storage. So with maize or any other grain, you harvest it when it's ready, and now you have to find a way to keep that grain edible until your next harvest. And that is the biggest problem in African agriculture is the post-harvest losses. Um, with a root like cassava, you can keep it in the ground. It's a, it's a um, true security crop, and the farmer can go out, pull up a plant when he needs it. Just to give you a sense of the scale of cassava in Africa, um, 120 million metric tons per year in Africa. That's the equivalent to 40% of the maize crop in the US. So a very significant amount. Um, some countries are so dominantly uh, cassava-based that up to 75% is in a single crop, such as in Angola. And these are the 11 countries are where most of the cassava is grown in Africa. People living in those countries, more than the US population. And they, three quarters of them live on less than $2 a day, and half of their kids are stunted. So you can get, kind of get a sense of the countries and the locations where cassava is playing a key role. Now moving on to the biology and the agriculture aspect, there's one aspect of cassava that's very important to understand for the genetics, and that's it's vegetatively propagated. So cassava is not an African crop. It came over from South America around the time the slave trade was beginning, and it's vegetatively propagated. So there has not been many generations of meiosis uh, going through. But the key point about the vegetative propagation, shown here on the left, is the stems that are planted in the ground. Um, this is a great way to transfer viruses. It's a great way for disease to spread across an entire continent. And so that is the next topic, and that is the viral constraints uh, for cassava production. There's two major viruses we need to be concerned about. One is mosaic disease, and this is um, a, a single-stranded DNA virus, a Gemini virus, that is transmitted by white flies. The important part about this one from a, um, a genomic standpoint is that there was a big outbreak in the 1990s, and Eastern Africa lost almost all of their cassava crops. And there was a very concerted effort to get resistance into the breeding materials. And so now there's not a single variety that's released in Africa that is not CMD resistant. So it can be done. It can, a, a campaign like that can be successful. It also means there's such high virus pressure that no material from South America can be brought directly into Africa because it will just die. The, um, cassava has not co-evolved in the presence of this virus. This virus is not in South America. That consequently means you cannot take African cassava to South America to do crosses. So where would you do crosses if you want to bring in um, resistance from other materials? So this is a challenge. Um, the second virus, which is a lot more insidious and a lot more urgent a problem, uh, this is cassava brown sheet disease. This is a virus that actually had a big outbreak back in 1930s, and there was a big um, breeding program increase in Tanzania called the Amani program, where they took wild species and crossed it with cultivated cassava and successfully put resistance into the breeding program. But then the virus disappeared, and they had no diagnostic tools to test whether the resistance was still in their breeding programs. So 50, 60 years later, the virus reappears. Guess what? No resistance left in the breeding program. So now, this disease has reappeared about 10 years ago, and it's a major problem. Uganda has declared this as the most significant threat to food security in that country. And the uh, West African countries, which are the biggest producers of cassava, are very nervous. Um, they are very, very uh, 
worried that this virus is going to head to their countries and decimate their productivity. The thing that's insidious about brown streak, I should have mentioned, is that the leaf phenotype is very minor. And the farmers don't necessarily know they have a problem. They think they have a backyard full of food. And they go and pull it up, and their roots look like this. So th this is why it's um, a, a big problem. With mosaic disease, they could just pull up the plants immediately. They know they have a problem. So how can genomics help? Um, in a crop such as maize or, or any of our um, crops that we use commercially, we've gotten used to this world where we have funding and we build together big data resources and genetic resources, and together these can then be applied to solving problems in a very practical way. And so in this example with maize, we have all of this information resource in the tan circle, and then on the outside we have either biotech solutions on the right or we have breeding solutions on the left using that information. Uh, with cassava in 2009, which is when we started this program, this is what we had. We had neither the data nor the applications uh, ready to use the data that were able to build on this. And so that was our first step, was to try and build those resources. So in 2009, a very fortuitous uh, event brought together Roche 454 and JGI. And they both donated half the resources to sequence the genome. Um, about six weeks after the phone call, given the approval to go ahead, we had all of the data generated. And the assembly was done and annotated and placed into Phytosome. So that was in 2009. And this was a you know, modest draft genome. Uh, it was all 454 based with a little bit of Sanger. And it was really a, a relatively cheap effort compared to the genomes of that time. But it was the first sequence, dense sequence, that the cassava community had ever seen. And so everybody was pretty happy for a while. But then we realized that the big applications are really around plant breeding. And plant breeding doesn't need all the individual genes. What it needs is chromosome scale um, representation of the genome. And so the first thing you would normally do is anchor it to a genetic map, start organizing that sequence around chromosome units. But our genetic map in the cassava community had 500 SSR markers, and that was it. So it was a very poor resource to be able to anchor 12,000 scaffolds. So we set about recently in the last 18 months or so to set up a, a consensus map consortium. And that was with a bunch of African partners. Uh, we, we polled all of their research programs to find out who had mapping populations ready to go. And at, JGI, uh, sorry, at uh, Berkeley, um, Dan's lab did full resequencing on the parents of the mapping populations and GBS on all of the F1 individuals for six different mapping populations. Individual maps were built. Um, a merged map was created. And that map now has 18 linkage groups. That's the first genetic map in cassava uh, to that point that had the same number of linkage groups as the plant has chromosomes. So it was a really, <laughs> it's a momentous time for cassava. Um, and 90% of the genes are anchored on that genetic map. So it's a, a step change in the quality of that resource. Um, and a lot of kudos go to both the graduate students who um, planted all of those populations and, and did the crosses. Because cassava is not an easy plant to do genetics with. And that's a whole other talk. Um, and particular credit to Jess and Simon and Cindy uh, at JGI in Berkeley for putting all this data together over the Christmas break. So we have. Um, the consensus genetic map, and we have a genome. Um, so now we have chromosome scale information. We can look at things that genome scientists usually look at, um, which is, for the most part, completely uninteresting to farmers in Africa. But we're genome scientists, so we have to produce figures like this. This shows a whole genome duplication in cassava uh, relative to the castor bean, which is the closest uh, other sequence genome. Uh, on the right is just showing the castor bean has a single copy and cassava has two. Um, but getting back to the real point, which is how do we use this genome uh, to find something interesting that can help the breeding efforts for brown streak? Um, so the next step is variation data, a very common approach to understand um, the opportunities in the species. And so we've taken two different approaches. Uh, for data collection here, we've done whole genome resequencing uh, 
of some materials that are apparent to the mapping populations, some other uh, um, various other accessions, as well as uh, some wild species accessions, and I'll come back to that in a second. We also had access to a diversity panel uh, that covered material from across um, different regions of Africa, uh, both land races, which are farmer varieties, and uh, improved varieties from breeding programs. So the obligatory slide showing variation data, I'm going to whiz through this, but just to say there's a lot of SNPs, there's a lot of deletions. Um, as with most plants, there's a lot of novel sequence that varies between lines. Um, and this bottom left panel simply shows that uh, missing from the reference, if we take the unmapped reads, we only get about a 1% extra sequence if we do a de novo assembly on that data. Missing from all the other lines, up to 15 or 17% of the genome is additional material that's found in these other accessions that's not in the variety that we sequenced as our reference. And many of these include resistance gene fragments. And this is a recurring theme in plant genomics. Similarly, we copy number changes. We found uh, 350 genes with significant copy number changes, and many of those are uh, resistance genes as well. One unexpected finding uh, from looking at this resequencing data is large stretches of homozygosity or, or lack of heterozygosity. Uh, cassava is a very heterozygous species generally. Um, it's a, it's a um, botanical outcrosser, so uh, you would expect high levels of heterozygosity. But we see here these are four different uh, sessions showing the, uh, the rate of heterozygosity in sliding windows. And you see in the, the middle of that second line a big seven meg stretch with very little heterozygosity. And so how does this come about? And I think the key here is to remember it's vegetatively propagated. So a botanical outcrossing event is pollen moving from one individual plant to another plant. A genetic outcrossing event requires those two individuals to be genetically different. If you have a vegetatively propagated crop, there's a very high probability that somewhere in the area is the exact same um, genetics as you. And so you end up with a genetic selfing event by a botanical outcrossing event. And so that would lead to a lot of uh, homozygosity coming into the breeding programs. Another um, insight we got from looking at this resequencing data relates to the wild species. Um, so Manhart glaziovii is a wild relative. It's a tree-like plant shown here. Um, very distinct from Manahat esculenta, which is the cultivated cassava. And we had access to two Glaziovii accessions and one F1 hybrid. Um, and that data allowed us to find SNPs that were diagnostic for the Glaziovii type and um, could then score all the other accessions for the presence of those Glaziovii alleles. And interestingly, three of the CBSD tolerant parents from the mapping populations that we knew came from this Amani breeding program back in the 1930s, they still have very significant amount of Glaziovii genome in them. And this is um, purple is showing the Glaziovii alleles in the heterozygous state. So these plants have one Esculenta chromosome and one Glaziovii chromosome where you see purple stretches. Um, so this is another indication that since the 1930s, there hasn't been many recombinations to get to today's material. Again, a, a feature of it being a vegetatively propagated crop. And interestingly, there is some overlap here between the purple segments between these three lines, and they are all brown streak tolerant. Is this just a coincidence that they happen to overlap here? We don't know yet. Uh, the mapping data is still underway. The phenotypes in the field haven't yet been completed. Um, we had GBS data from um, a diversity panel. And the 377 lines here, and this is an IBD analysis done by Cindy at Berkeley. And you see here the, um, the three colors. Uh, red indicates two haplotypes are identical between that comparison. Green is one haplotype is in common, so this would be a parent-child relationship. Um, and then blue is unrelated. So you see we have some pockets of uh, quite closely related, and some, some parents appear to um, be commonly used in the in the population. But if we intersect those two studies, the Glaziovii integration and the diversity panel uh, GBS data, even though GBS data is a lot more patchy than whole genome sequencing, we can see um, 
stretches of Glasia ovii segments in many more lines than just those that came from the Armani breeding program. So uh, here's an IGV view of chromosome 2. And wherever you see these dots going from left to right, that's an accession that has a lot of Glasia ovii segments in chromosome 2. And if you then map that onto the phylogenetic tree, you see that all of those lines are, are related. So showing that somewhere back in that um, pedigree, there was a, uh, an integration that left a segment of uh, Glasia ovii in, on chromosome 2. If we look further, there are some lines that have almost uh, half of the genome in Glasia ovii, so it suggests a very recent uh, hybridization event. And then there's other segments that have additional chromosome segments in common. So this shows that Glasia ovii has become part of the African breeding programs um, much more than people expected. And we don't, ex we don't have a lot of records showing all of these, um, the pedigree of all of these lines. Um, but this is the kind of data that uh, can feed into planning future crosses. OK, so our next steps. Um, as a genomics-focused program, we had a particular partnership with the CBSD uh, mapping projects run by Morag Ferguson in uh, IITA in Nairobi. And that's still our major focus. And that is to resequence um, additional mapping parents if they come to us, because they're, they're constantly finding new sources of resistance. Um, we're weighting the field phenotypes on the varieties that we've already sequenced. Um, and if you remember the resequencing data, I talked about the novel sequence that's present in different accessions. Well, some, it's very likely that within there are the resistance genes that are not in the reference, gene, the reference genome sequence. And so de novo strategy is to assemble in targeted regions of QTL um, locations is going to be really important to do that well. And so technologies such as the long reads, the molecular, uh, large mate pairs, all of those kind of strategies, not applied to the reference genome, but applied to uh, varieties that show particular traits of interest, that approach is going to be very important. Um, we also have plans to do further improvement of that reference genome. Um, remember, the application here is breeding, so it doesn't need to be perfect, but it does need to be as useful as possible. Whoops, sorry. Um, and lastly, because of the insights we're getting from the Glasia ovi sequence, uh, there's renewed interest in looking at more wild uh, relatives. And so we have additional plans to do some resequencing uh, on multiple uh, wild relatives. So where are we now? Um, we have, this is the state we thought we were in in, in 2009. Well, we do now have most of these uh, data resources, uh, and they're growing. Um, and we're starting to see applications pop up in other projects. So this is not work we're doing. This is work that's being enabled by the resources uh, that are now out there. Uh, there are projects funded to do targeted mutagenesis on particular genes in the cassava genome to trigger uh, herbicide tolerance. Uh, there's work to do biofortification using uh, knowledge of the pathways that are in cassava. And there's even talk of doing a project to engineer improved photosynthetic efficiency uh, in cassava. Uh, so that's all on the biotech side. On the breeding side, it's even more uh, promising. Um, very large numbers of association mapping and QTL studies being done um, by scientists in Africa using the technologies uh, of today. Um, there's a very large project called NextGen Cassava that JGI is a part of, um, and that is to deploy genomic selection, which is a, a, a very um, advanced breeding approach that is very popular in the animal breeding world uh, that's gaining a lot of traction in plant breeding. And uh, Gates Foundation has funded a big project there to really bring the most advanced breeding approaches we have to cassava uh, to rapidly accelerate um, cassava breeding. There's also a large database called Cassava Base that's being produced, which really tries to connect tools for the breeders to the genomic information. And then lastly, there's a lot of uh, plans in the works to try and develop the logistics to deliver microassisted selection to breeding programs in multiple countries around Africa so they can actually use the information that comes from the QTL and association mapping studies. The overall point I want to make here is that um, the state of cassava is getting brighter, um, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, 
want to acknowledge the work of many people here. I, I, since I moved from Arizona, I've really played very little role in the day-to-day -day work. Uh, most of it's been done um, by others. We have a great group of African collaborators and a very productive group um, led by Dan uh, at, at Berkeley and then Simon at JGI have been great contributors to this. Uh, we have um, still a lot of work to do, but one of the key points is trying to transfer as much of the knowledge and capabilities through training to the African scientists. So a lot of this can be done by them in their own countries. Um, and so uh, one thing I would like to mention to all of you is if you have the opportunities to host students from Africa or provide some training in this very cutting edge stuff that you all do, I think it's a great use of your time. And I've found it a lot more, a lot more freeing and sort of empowering to have people jo come join us for training and then go back and know that you've helped uh, kickstart a program somewhere else. And that's a really good way of using your time. So I want to thank all of these people. And then just leave you with this image to remind us all that um, there are some real people who need some very basic improvements that can be done. Um, but we just have to focus on the very practical side of applying this data, uh, this wonderful data that has wonderful intellectual challenges to explore in directions that can lead us either away from practical solutions or towards practical solutions. And I'd just like to urge us to try and go towards the practical solutions where we can. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. <coughs> Question in the back from Jim. Right here. Uh, I'm curious about the interaction between the existing breeders uh, for cassava and the the developing uh, directed uh, directed breeding programs that are that are being developed and what that interaction is like. So it's actually the same people. Um, in terms of so, if we take that next gen cassava project as an example. Um, this is not Cornell University or JGI imposing a solution on uh, unwitting breeders uh, who, who, who aren't prepared. This is actually a true partnership with uh, the National Breeding Program of Nigeria, the National Breeding Program of Uganda, um, and taking some of the young, enthusiastic breeders who have been trained in more modern um, genetics, uh, more quantitative uh, uh, leaning breeders, um, and then really trying to enable them so they can take that up through their management. There's always management involved, right? So um, the older breeders tend to be the, the managers of the national programs. And you know, if, you, if you get through the door to them, um, through their young uh, colleagues, I think that's the best way. We have the same problem in industry here in the US as well. Um, the high technology and the traditional breeding, unless you work at that relationship, it, it's going to fail. So it is important to, uh, to get those two sides working together. So. I think that's one of the great roles that, the, that Steve and the Gates Foundation have played is every year at, around PAG time, there's always a big uh, convocation of people from all around the world. And people are making these decisions collectively. And also, I want to echo what Steve said. We've had several visitors to our lab at JGI and at Berkeley, and have sent people from our lab to Africa. And it's been incredibly exciting and really invigorates the research. So I think it's, it's a wonderful thing. Other questions? If not, let's thank Steve again.